Hello, The Poor Man's Guide to Suicide by Andrew Armacost is the novel we'll be looking at in this video. It is the story of the first person narrator Wesley Weimar. He wants to die. He hates being alive. Life doesn't bring him any joy. And if his life were to come to an end, that would be great, he thinks. Before we look into how Wesley sets out to bring his life to an end, let us draw the profile of our narrator. Wesley is a self-loathing, divorced, father of two, misanthropic prison guard. He is deeply depressed, but he still gets to be interesting through his sense of humour and his sharp critique of the human condition. It doesn't take you long to discover that. Let me use a quote from the very first page to give you a glimpse of the tone of the novel. It it is the opening statement in the novel. This is the first thing Wesley tells us. For a long time now, I've wanted to kill myself. The closer Christmas gets, the worse I feel about everything. Wesley lives in a decrepit house. He doesn't have anything of value, and how could he? He lives on 60% of the salary of a prison guard. The other 40% goes to child support. He's been married twice, divorced twice, and he has two kids. Wesley has an infirm mother. She has lost her sight, and Wesley does care a lot for her despite his misanthropy. He's constantly denigrating people's appearances and decision-making, but he doesn't criticise people in their faces. He does it in monologues that only we get to hear, but his mother, he loves. So why does Wesley want to die? The whole novel constitutes the answer to that question. Wesley has come to the conclusion that if anybody were to remove all the distractions that life is full of, he would see it for what it really is, and that would immediately make him want out. We quickly learn that Wesley is pretty well read. He expresses his disagreement with Marcel Proust, the French writer of one of the lengthiest novels, Remembrance of Things Past. Wesley refers to a major idea in Proust's novel. It is the idea of iridescence. Very simply put, it is when things look different depending on from which angle you look at them. It is like what happens with those pictures that keep changing when you look at them from different perspectives, when you squint or change the lighting. Proust used the concept of iridescence to account for nostalgia. Wesley references a direct quote from Remembrance of Things Past. The quote is, The only paradise is paradise lost. The quote expresses Proust's taken nostalgia and the objects of desire. Memories are not objectively good. We only cherish the things we don't have because we look at them from a different angle, iridescence. The same thing goes for objects of desire. The moment we have them, they no longer bring us joy or happiness. Experiences are mundane when they are lived, but then after time passes, we remember them with fondness as if they were fabulous because they are no longer accessible and we feel sorry that we can't live them again because there is no way of going back in time. It happens with old video games that we used to play as kids or family dishes that our grandmothers used to prepare for us, or shows that we used to watch on television or any type of experience. A remembrance of playing the video games or tasting the dishes is embellished. It is a paradise because we don't have access to it. This is the source of the continuous state of discontent that humans are plagued with. Wesley disagrees with that. For him, the discontent comes from removing all the distractions and looking at the sadistic beast that is life right in the eyes and seeing it for what it is. He gives many examples of how he truly was happy when he was young and was entangled in layers of distractions. Or, for example, how he can no longer enjoy strip clubs because he lost the suspension of disbelief. He writes, Long ago, I lost the suspension of disbelief one needs in order for strip clubs to do what they're designed to do. Once the illusion is gone, it's gone. There's no getting it back. This bit about strippers epitomises Wesley's thoughts on life. The moment you know the reality of life, you cannot unknow it. He further describes what the strippers really want, saying, among these young, tight-skinned sexual athletes, not one, not even one fosters the slightest desire to feel me jock hammering away between those nubile thighs, and I can't deceive myself even though I'd like to for a while. They want what little money I have left, and that's all. It makes me feel pathetic. Used. A victim. 
For example, when Wesley is at a New Year's Eve party and there is a good-looking girl called Darshana who shows some interest in him. He thinks it's impossible for somebody like him to spark interest in somebody like her. First, he reckons that she's an escort that his friend has secretly hired. And when it's midnight and people customarily exchange kisses, Wesley says, Wasting her midnight kiss on a frog of a prison who had no chance of turning into a prince. The statement refers to the fairy tale of the frog who turns into a prince after he has been kissed by a princess. The fairy tale represents the fake positivity that drugs people out of reality. Wesley would later attack that positivity that is spread through movies, books, stories and Hollywood. Real life is much uglier. The frog doesn't turn into a prince. There are many examples that show Wesley's self-hatred. Every time he gets ready for work, he laments on how ridiculous he looks in a prison guard uniform. Another important theme in the novel is that every human life inescapably hemorrhages whatever quality it has. Wesley describes how he is to have an athlete's body, his friend Ed too, but that their bodies have become uglier and are continuously getting uglier. Wesley has got skinnier and has lost muscles, Ed has got fatter and his belly is protruding. Another example is found in friendships that wither with time until they disappear. He describes how good friends he and Bigard were, but all that warmth and friendship evaporated. Wesley writes, our entire friendship is a shell, or more like a ghost. A ghost is transparent, weightless. Ghosts are believed to have been people made of bones and flesh, and that's what happens to friendships. They start strong and then they become transparent and unreal. A third example that shows the regression of life's quality is when Wesley thinks about scolding his daughter Gretchen for partying too hard and getting drunk. Then he decides not to, and he says, What can you really say to teenagers except hurry up and enjoy a little happiness before it vanishes, before it all gets swallowed up by the innumerable dead ends and dark alleyways, before it all disappears into the blind spots and potholes of life, because in time this youthful love of life will pass through so many spiritual black holes, get gobbled up by so many supernovas, left over from self-aborted dreams until the only thing left of your love of life is a wistful echo that tortures your subconscious like some long ago and forever dead romance that was made possible only by your childish ignorance. This is beautifully put. Wesley has pity on Gretchen. What life is said to do to her is already more terrible than any punishment a parent can decree. The next theme is bodily pain. There is a recurring theme throughout the novel that focuses on how our bodies are designed to experience excruciating pain. There is this graphic image of Wesley's stepfather's death. Wesley describes it. My stepfather died on the bathroom floor bleeding from both ends, as they say, because an ulcer had perforated his stomach. I'm planning to dedicate a video to five powerful quotes from the book and their discussion. This one is definitely making the list. I'll be uploading it in a couple of days. When he was considering different ways of committing suicide, Wesley thought about a drug overdose because apparently it's the least pain causing. Wesley's main concern is how not to feel pain. When Wesley shoots the prisoner Jose, he doesn't die immediately. He marinates in pain for quite a bit of time, although his face explodes before he is released from life. Armacost wants to focus on the idea that we don't die easily or fast. We suffer. The deal with Grandpa. Wesley strikes a deal with a prisoner. There's an old chap called Grandpa. According to their deal, Grandpa should kill Wesley and get $10,000 in return. Wesley only has $2,000. It puts even more pressure on him to get the remaining $8,000. He thinks of asking his mother to loan him the money. After all, she'll be making good profit with the insurance price she'll get after his death. But he feels ashamed asking his mother for money. He remains confident he will get the money and be called by Grandpa before the end of the year. $8,000 is not a huge sum. It's interesting how Wesley's mental state and quality of life improve after he strikes the deal with Grandpa. This is something stoicism underlines. 
For the Stoics, not considering suicide the taboo and having it as one option amongst other options is liberating. It removes inhibition and fear because the person tells himself there's nothing to be terrified of. Worst case scenario, if I don't like the turn of events, I just do that thing and be done. And it is this what makes Wesley's life a little better after his planned thing suit with Grandpa. This situation of the sudden improvement of Wesley's mental state is a good representation of one of the most famous quotes by Greek philosopher Epictetus, where he says, Is there smoke in the room? If it be slight, I remain. If grievous, I quit, for you must remember this and hold it fast, that the door stands open. Then during a New Year's Eve party, Wesley drinks a little too much, breaks down and tells Cooper about the suicide plan. It shocks Cooper. The man does everything to dissuade Wesley from having himself killed. He tells him that he's loved, he suggests to give him money, which Wesley immediately refuses out of pride. But Cooper's huge concern touches Wesley. Then Cooper's father gets incarcerated in the same prison where Wesley works. Cooper's father being an ex-copper, there is a real concern that he might get seriously hurt by the prisoners as an act of reprisals. Wesley, who feels indebted to Christopher Cooper, breaks the law to help his friend's father, Harold Cooper. Wesley smuggles into the prison nicotine gum that he gives to Harold. In prison, cigarettes are like money. Cigarettes are too risky to smuggle in, so Wesley goes for nicotine gum, and it works. Buying the gum and getting it to Harold is stressful at times, but it gives Wesley purpose and it helps his friend's father live a little more comfortably in prison. Wesley keeps smuggling in the gum until Harold fails to eschew one murder attempt and kicks the bucket. The news of his father's death devastates Cooper. However, all this investment in the Cooper's lives and theirs in his has made Wesley give up his suicidal thoughts. He says that he has understood some new aspects of life. Now, if I were to point to the one thing that I think is not done well, it would be this reversal. Apparently, it's the sense of purpose that he gained from committing to delivering the nicotine gum to Harold. It's in line with Frankel's philosophy of the importance of having a purpose or purposes in one's life, but I think it's not well enough built into the novel. After Harold's death, Wesley is bereaved of that sense of purpose that smuggling the nicotine gum provided. He almost relapses in depression, but he doesn't. He detects a financial opportunity. Now that Harold is no longer alive, Wesley could keep smuggling the gum, sell it to the inmates and make some profit. And in a eureka moment, it dawns on him that much of his sadness was due to the lack of money. Wesley starts to make good tax-free money from selling the nicotine gum to the prisoners. He doesn't spend a lot and saves as much as he can until he amasses $117,000. This allows him to go back to school, he quits his job by having himself fired, he is relieved of child support because he's no longer employed, he even manages to get back his son Shane to live with him by setting up Andre, or Yellow as he was nicknamed for hiding drugs in Shane's backpack while it was Wesley who bought the cocaine, sued it in his son's backpack and called child support. The new Wesley takes risks and does things. In his final reflection on life, Wesley says that it's important to remain within society and to do that, he watches sports, he tries to keep up with the news to have things to say to people. At the very end of the novel, Wesley concedes that he doesn't have any answers. There is not a whole lot he knows about the human condition, and who does? He finally says that maybe we are meat machines paired with a strong survival instinct, and which Wesley has tried to override, but couldn't. There's also the change that his friend Cooper undergoes from being seemingly happy to live in through the disintegration of his family, to losing his father, to regaining his family. It has made Wesley understand that life is not black or white, it is what we make of it. Wesley further explains how he has come to accept life. He says, looking back on a blue period of my life, I see now that much of my sadness had been caused by habit and routine. Repetition erodes life. Then he goes on about how he's now driving a new car, trying different food, meeting different people, going to different places. He identifies variety as the antidote of routine. 
difference fills life in, fills it up. He further describes how he's got now a girlfriend, a Japanese exchange student named Fumiko. But let's engage his thoughts. He has always believed that the only way not to see life for what it is, is to busy oneself with things to do, to distract oneself from looking at life. If you look at what's the difference between following a routine and doing new things, the difference is that following a routine requires less processing power, less efforts. You're left with time and energy that you dedicate to looking at life and you end up seeing it for what it really is. Towards the very end of the novel, Wesley reveals what has changed in him to discard the thought of suicide. He says that the key is to rid yourself of optimism and positivity. Since the day we're born, there's a filter of unreal positivity that distorts the way we look at the world and make sense of it. Stories like the turtle and the rabbit are misleading and dangerous. Yes, the turtle defeated the rabbit in a race, but in a million other races, the rabbit will outrun the turtle. Due to no fault of his or her, the turtle will be defeated by the rabbit. Life is not just, it's harsh and painful. We're submerged by feel-good stories, books, narratives, movies that make us think this world is good, is just. There is the idea of karma that rewards good deeds, while in reality there is none of that. When we live experiences that tear away the rainbows and sunshine painting we've been drawing for years, we suffer to the point of wanting to die. Wesley also describes how we're surrounded by objects of desire that we can never get and this creates a continuous state of frustration. He says, as looking at all the magazines designed to make us feel like shit, to remind us of all the things we'll never have, never be, the people we'll never screw or even meet, the cars we can't drive, the places we'll never see, the clothes we can't wear, the homes we can't afford, the lives of the upper 0.001%. The novel ends with the new Wesley who no longer wants to die. The new Wesley accepts his mediocrity and the mediocrity of life. But I think that what Wesley's doing by mingling with people and trying new things is just busying himself with things to do, not to look directly at life and see it for what it is, which is good old distraction. And I predict chances are Wesley will relapse. Now this video has reached its end. Until we meet again, have a great day.